Hello, good morning. Uh, I just shared my video. Does it work? Because I just had to put a new video up here on this computer. I didn't have one before. Yes. Okay, great. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Tom King. I'm an instructor for the Linux Foundation, and I teach primarily in the uh, embedded space. So the Octo Project, embedded Linux, embedded uh, kernel drivers, things like that. Uh, for my real job, I'm a consulting engineer uh, in the broadcast field, uh, do a lot of things related to digital audio, digital video, stuff like that. So a lot of that for the last 45 years or so. I've uh, been an instructor for about seven years now, really enjoying that. That's a lot of fun. And so today I'm going to be taking the second half, if you will. I've shared my screen here. It looks like... Um, Looks like I'm sharing my screen there, or as that goes. And we're just going to continue on here. So very good. All right. Very good. Let me start the presentation here. All right. Um, looks like everything's going right. So apparently he left off uh, at when things go wrong. You'll notice that the title of this chapter or the title of this section is when things go wrong, not if things will go wrong. They typically do go wrong, and that's something that uh, that you can expect in, in any build, really, and especially one as complicated as building an entire OS from scratch, which is what we're doing here. So one of the things when I first started in 2004 was we used to call bit make bit break because about you know, it seemed to be about once or twice a build, we'd end up with it crashing and burning and having issues. And at that time, it wasn't always so easy to figure out exactly where things broke. Uh, things have come along quite a bit uh, since then. Definitely uh, the way that they handle things now is, is much better. But of course, then it was single threaded. So it was pretty easy to find the last thing that happened, go back and look at the log file related to that and be able to deal with that. Today's log files, on the other hand, are scattered across multiple directories. You have no idea what exactly was being built at the time. Well, you do because you're going to get a log message with regard to it. But as you know, if you looked at it, it may be doing 5, 10, 15, 20 things building at a time. So consequently, it's a little bit harder to be able to solve problems like that. However, uh, one of the things that's really good now is, is that BitBake does give you a message that says, hey, it broke here. And by the way, go look at this path and this particular log file and you'll find the error. So that's where we're going to start here. So we're going to talk about some of the tools that we have available to us for that. So each recipe does have its own environment. I noticed there were questions about environments earlier today. Each one of them has its own environment variables. Everything is set up to build that particular thing. All the methods that are required to build that recipe. So if you need to build a kernel, we're using those methods. If you need to build a library such that it can be linked against, we've got methods with regard to that as well. You'll notice also that we've also had each one of the variables for that particular recipe are going to be set for that particular environment. And then, of course, if you have your own do compile or do install steps, it will go ahead and do that. So you can be either bypass the tasks, you can augment the tasks by making them either happen before or after an, a task using the do compiles, do install, or maybe some appends, right? We can do all of that because BitBake allows us to use um, executable metadata. You'll notice that we can set in this particular case, we could set the the uh, work directory is where the where the actual source is going to be unpacked and and eventually configured. So what does this all mean, right? We've gone and looked at some of those variables, I'm sure, earlier. So what does it really mean? What we're looking at, however, is we're trying to look at the in total environment of the system and figure out what went wrong. So let's take a look at it here now. Remember that, of course, you can use bitbake minus E here. The minus E option says, tell me what the environment variables are. You can use it without a recipe, and it will tell you the entire environment. Now, that's not very useful, in, in my opinion, in a, unless you've started at the beginning and you haven't actually built anything. Let's say you've done all the parsing steps, but you haven't actually started to build everything. 
at that point, you can see what the environment's going to be looking like. You can see what architecture you're building for, what options you're going to have for the compiler, those kinds of things. After that, after you start building, it's really only useful on a recipe by recipe basis. So you can look at what the environment's going to be for that particular recipe. So Bitbake minus E will show you where you're going to build, where the output directory is going to be, what options you're, you're passing into the compiler, things like that, or to the linker, for example, right? We're going to go ahead and take a look, for example, we're going to look for that S equals variable to find out where our kernel source is, or rather not where our kernel source, but rather where our source is going to be unpacked, right? So we're going to be looking for that. So in this particular case, you'll notice, yes, it is kernel source here because we're going to be building a recipe that's virtual kernel. We're going to find that it's in home, our home directory, Yocto build temp, TMP, work shared, right? This is our work shared by architecture, in this case, QMU arm, and then the actual kernel source itself. So that's where we're going to actually unpack that kernel source that we downloaded, that we fetched, if you will. At that point, we're going to go ahead and apply those patches, do the configuration, and continue to build. So what file was used for building this recipe? Well, we're going to look at it. In, the, in this case, we're going to use NetBake. What file did we actually use? Well, we're going to use this NetBase BB 5.3 BB file here. Remembering that the 5.3 is important here because that becomes our PV. That's our version, if you will, of the package. And it's going to, BitBake is going to actually use that unless you override it to become the version that you're going to be building of that particular recipe, in this particular case, NetBase. Okay. So let's take a look at continuing here. Let's take a look. We're going to look at PF. So PF is the package full. So that's going to include the package name foo. A, a version number, it's going to be underscore a version number such as 5.3. And then we might have release 5, for example. So that would be PF or package full. So in this case, we're using NetBase 1, version 5.3, release 0. Okay. So that's the full name, if you will. What's the recipes build directory here? Normally, the build directory is equal to set to S, which is our, where our source has been unpacked. It can be something different if we choose to do so. It doesn't have to be there. And indeed, sometimes isn't there, especially with, when you use certain CMSs, you might be building in a different directory than where the CMS comes out so that you can actually check it out and put it in the correct directory. So in this case, you'll see again, it's in home, Yocto, build. Remember this temp T TMP work and then by architecture again, in this case, QEMU Arch Pocky Linux, GNU ABI, right? That's our that's for our, our, our ARM32 because it's QEMU ARM. Linux Yocto, so we're doing a Linux directory here. And then you'll notice also it has this auto ink plus, a, uh, plus an additional commit there. So that's gonna be actually what the recipe is here. You'll notice we're using continuation symbols to make it a little bit easier for us to see things. And you'll notice that it's a UQMU standard build. Now that turns out to be one of the branches that you can check out when you're building QEMU ARM. So if you're building for a particular architecture, let's say you're building for a specific machine such as a BeagleBone Black, you'll go ahead and instead of checking out this branch, Linux QEMU ARM, it would be actually for the BeagleBone, which has a different branch, if you will. Okay. Additionally, we might not know what packages were actually output by a recipe. So a recipe, for example, doesn't have, doesn't necessarily have to have just one output. You might end up with, for example, a native version or a native SDK version of something as well. You might be building a, you might be building a, um, a package that outputs more than one thing. So for example, here, we're gonna build a kernel, but we're also gonna build a kernel base. We're also gonna build a kernel for VM Linux version of it, a kernel image, a development version, 
we're going to also be building the modules because we're building a kernel. We want to be able to do that. And we also, because we're using QEMU ARM, we also have to actually build the device tree as well. So we have to invoke the device tree com compiler for your particular machine. In our case here, we're going to be building for QEMU ARM. That's our actual machine here. Okay. Packages can emit more than one actual package when you're done and they might be packaged up individually and differently. So for example, the kernel itself may get packaged up as VM Linux, VM Linux, you might have noticed that before. We're also gonna actually make it so that we create our modules and our device tree. Both of those are gonna be installed alongside of the actual kernel image that we're gonna use. So we're gonna have to install all those in the right place. So the kernel modules, for example, get installed in the root file system. Whereas the device tree and the VM Linux and any and, and, and any init RD or a NIT RAM disk would actually be put perhaps in a different location, maybe still inside of the root file system. Depends on whether you're using U-boot or something else, for example. So all of this information tells us all the different places we might want to look to make sure that we find what's going on with the actual build. Well, what about the log files here? So there's log files, BitBake has log files, and those log files are per, they're two things, they're per build. That is to say, you'll notice what the, what the actual cooker is, you know, what the machine log is here. But additionally, there are by recipe, an entire, and by architecture, a complete set of log files. There's another set of files as well called run files that we'll talk about here in just a minute. You'll notice that it's looking at all the different tests. Now, it turns out this happens to be in order that they were actually done. So that's kind of nice because normally we don't see that. If we take a look at what the, if we use list tests, for example, it gives us something in alphabetical order, but doesn't tell us what the actual order of the tasks were. This you'll notice here in this log here from the cooker, right? This is because we're baking, we have a cooker for this QEMU ARM architecture here is gonna tell us what the actual order of the tasks as they were performed. So you'll notice we did a fetch, then an unpack, a patch configure. We're gonna populate the license because we, do, we keep track of all the licenses so we know what's in our images. We go ahead and do a compile step. There's an install. We're going to populate that sysroot, and then we're going to deal with the packaging data and all that packaging QA stuff. And then finally, we're going to do the rootFS when we're done with all this. So we know the exact task order in this particular case. Most of the time, we're not really going to look at this, right? We're going to look at this to see where it got, although we're going to generally know where it's going to crash because it's going to tell us. Every recipe does produce a lot of log output. That is actually quite useful for us. We can use it for diagnostics. We can use it for debugging. Um, we can keep track of it all to do look at differences between builds, for example. Very common to use that. There's some there's some um, there's some BB classes which allow us to look at build history, and then we can tell what changed and what happened as a result of that build history by using that. In this particular case here, we're going to use the environment variable to find the log files. Now, like I said, normally what you'll see is you'll see a nice red output. If you're if you're on a console here, you'll see a nice red output. And in the middle of that red output will be a very long path. And that long path is going to be directly into the log file where the error occurred. You can also find the, the actual path by looking at your T directory here, right? By by looking for the T directory here, and you'll notice that it's home yocto build temp work, right? Arm, and then you'll notice that there's also a temp down here. So when we talk about temp, we have to be careful as to we're talking about the build temp directory or this temp directory where your logs are going to exist. There's a whole bunch of other files in there besides log files, and you'll see that if you take a look. And that's done on an individual build basis by architecture. So that's really important to note. Remember that you can build multiple architectures with this. You can build QEMU ARM, and you can also build a native or a native SDK version of it. 
at the same time. So you'll have to make sure that you're using the correct version of it. And you'll notice also that there isn't just a single directory for all these builds. There's ones that are, for example, for Q, uh, x86-64. And you're sitting there going, well, I'm not building x86-64. Well, yes, you actually are because you're building natives as well. And so the natives would go in there, for example, depending on what architecture you're building on. Okay, as far as that goes, each, each task that runs for a recipe produces a log file and also a run file. And those are all in that workdir temp. Here's our workdir all the way down to this. That's what workdir is, right? This temp directory underneath it is where all those log files live. And so inside of that, you'll notice that there's log underscore and then the various tasks, right? Pap, fetch. Are they in order? Mm, sort of. The order that they're in primarily is, you know, because they're log underscore do and then whatever the actual task is, you'll notice that they're in that kind of an order as far as that goes. They can be reordered by based upon time and a whole bunch of other things, depending on how you want to do that. Right. The output of these actually contains the output of the respective tasks for each recipe. Yes and no. Remember that we may invoke make or we may invoke uh, CMake or something like that. That's not necessarily what you're going to see here. As a matter of fact, in the log file, you're going to see what Bitbake did to build this. You're not going to be able to look inside of the make file here. If you want to take do, see exactly what Bitbake did and the conversation that it was having with make and, and, and actually creating things, you have to look in the run files. That's where you'll find all of the commands that were actually issued. The log files, on the other hand, are going to tell you where things broke. They're going to tell you, they're going to, you're going to get a one line to five line, 10 line output for each one of the things that potentially broke there. And you can say, hey, um, it broke in the make file broke. It went into a directory and it looked for something that couldn't find it. That's what you're going to see in these log files. And again, they're by each task. So if it breaks in the fetch task because it couldn't find the URL, you'll find the error message in this log file right here. Okay. Now, additionally, to make things easier, you'll find that there might be multiple log files that are related to fetch or multiple log files that are related to compile. Well, to make things easier for you in order to make it so that you actually can, can see it, you'll actually find that there's a sim link that simply looks at do underscore install and that sim link will point to the last run, to the last completed task, I should say, uh, or not completed, but the last run task. So if it didn't get all the way through to compile because it failed in the, in the, uh, um, in the configuration step, then you won't find one that associates with, you know, because it didn't make it, didn't make it through to that step. If it failed in that configure step, you'll have a log file of that configure step and it'll point to the last one. So otherwise it'll generally have a date time group there. So you can actually see it. it it's also by something called, they call PID, PID. So you'll take a look at the process ID that was being run at the time that the table, at the time that you are running the task, as far as that goes, all right? So in addition to in addition to uh, having log files, we also have run files. Let's say, for example, you want to look further into things and try and troubleshoot the build a little bit further. Maybe it's a bit big thing. Maybe it's something that's related to upstream and their problem, you know, for whatever the task is. Let's say you're building nano, for example, and there's a bug in the build in nano. That's not necessarily a problem with Bitbake, but Bitbake's going to tell you it broke, right? And then you're going to have to go look at that run file to see what actually really happened. And usually you can figure that out. Either you, it's a known bug upstream or, or there's a patch for it that you missed, for example. That's not unusual to see things like that. Again, same thing here where you have the do underscore patch with a sim link to the uh, run underscore do underscore patch. Um, you'll find it pointed to the last time it was run. There'll be multiples potentially in the directory as well. Again, we have a lot of log files. It also makes it so that you can use that build history to do to take a look at the difference between them. 
So for example, if you have two runs one after another, you can see what broke between the two of them, for example. Very, very useful to be able to, to, to work with here. There's a lot of other files that are in here as well, but we're not gonna talk about them. Some of them are BitBake specifically related to that you that 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 somebody who uh, is a BitBake developer might ask you to uh, give them information on. Okay. Are there any questions on any of this before we move on? All right. Very good. So now that we've gone ahead and debugged it, you've talked about recipes a little bit earlier. Now we're going to talk about how do we build a full image. There are a number of different ways to do that. Some of them are predefined for you. Some of them are things that you might want to do yourself. Some of them are, you know, might want to add and extend and customize your image, if you will. Generally speaking, we don't say we're going to remove anything. We generally say we're going to add things. It's not easy to do removes, much easier to do builds. So let's talk about how we build that full in system here. Of course, we the first thing we're going to want to do is download the Octo project sources, right? We're going to want to either use Git clone. We can go ahead and uh, build one of those reference Linux distributions. In this particular case, we might build for QEMU x86 or QEMU ARM. And we might use one of those predefined images here. Now, let me go back to this because I kind of skipped over it here. So this is one way you can get it. You can obviously clone the Kirkstone version of the branch, or you can go ahead and get, for example, there's no reason why you couldn't get something else if you're going to use Git. You can also go to downloads.yoctoproject.org and grab the correct version and get the, a tarball of the whole thing if you'd rather do that, if you want to start with the Octo project here. And indeed, that's where I suggest that you start with. You might also get something from, for example, your vendor, for example, might give you something. Let's say you've got something like Pedal Linux or maybe you purchased Wind River Linux or something like that. You'll get a combination of things and they'll tell you how to specifically use that as far as that goes, okay? Once you go ahead and download that, set up the environment correctly, the next thing you're gonna wanna do is edit that local.conf. You're gonna wanna make sure that it's got everything that you want in there and nothing points to the right uh, directory for your shared state cache, points to the right directory for your downloads and makes it so that you can then decide what machine you're gonna actually build for. So we, in this case, we may build for QEMU ARM, or maybe we build for QEMU x86. Doesn't really matter as far as that goes. Our first test is probably going to be something simple. We're not going to build kernel and a, and X windows and everything else. Let's go ahead and just build something simple. We use bit bake minus K. Get in the get in the muscle memory habit of using minus K, so that it will continue on until it just basically can't continue anymore. Nothing worse than walking out the door, thinking that you're going to build a full image overnight and walking back, then coming back in the next morning and finding that five minutes into the build, it couldn't find a source and therefore it just quit and stopped. So get in the habit of using bitpeg minus K so that it'll just continue until it can't do any more. Very, very important here. We're going to use core image minimal. That's one of the recipes from our meta layer. We haven't talked about layers yet here. We'll talk about layers here in just a minute. But that's one of the things that we comes from what we call open embedded core or meta. Once we get done building uh, that core image minimal, we're going to go ahead and run it. Now we have a nice little application here, a little helper app that runs QEMU for us. It sits there and recognizes what the, if you tell it what architecture, you have to tell it what architecture it is, it's gonna go look for the last build of that particular architecture and try and use that to boot QEMU. Okay, so if QEMU finds an x86, QEMU x86 image that you built, and you'll notice that you've set this for QEMU x86 here, and we're gonna go ahead and bit make that Q, uh, core image minimal, we'll go ahead and boot it up. And assuming that everything worked correctly, you'll be able to log into that QMU x86 core image minimal and prop it, right? Well, there's a whole lot more to actually make that work. That is probably 
the first thing that you might want to do just to verify that your build environment is set up correctly. You've set up the downloads correctly. You've set up where the where the shared state cache is correctly. You've set it up so that um, you have all the appropriate tools that you need for to build that tool chain, to build that initial tool chain here. So most of the time, if you get to here, you're a long ways down the road as far as that goes. Again, when we first started, this was a lot, whole lot harder than it is today. The Octo Project's tooling has made things a lot simpler and, and the ability to actually get up and get started and working um, is far and away better than it ever was. So that's wonderful. Makes life a whole lot easier here. So let's take a look at the host systems layout here, all right? In your home Yocto directory, which is where you're gonna untar and set up your environment here, you're gonna have a build directory. You can call it whatever you want. One of those build directories might be QMU x86, or it might be x86, you might call it, or maybe you're gonna call it your machine, which is your foo, foo machine here. We recommend that you go ahead and put your downloads at that same level. That is to say, it'll be outside of your build. The reason why we want to put our, outs our downloads outside of our build is so that you can share it with other builds, right? If you put it inside of the build, it makes it harder to find. We just suggest that you share it among yourself, you know, with multiple builds by putting it outside at this Yocto level here. Additionally, you'll have the Pocky directory. That's going to be what you downloaded from the Yocto project. It'll be whatever Pocky version that you have in here. You'll notice we say don't modify anything in here, right? We don't want to do that. We don't want to modify anything in this directory here. Inside of this directory, you're going to find things such as Meta, which is a layer uh, that contains a whole bunch of recipes that everybody needs. We're going to find a BSP layer from Yocto, and we're also going to find the Meta Pocky layer in here along with a copy of Bitbake and along with a copy of documentation and a whole bunch of stuff. So this Pocky directory is something we're going to use throughout our entire build, but we're not actually going to modify anything in there at all. So be aware of that. Additionally, the storage shared state cache generally should be, again, put at the same layer. And the reason why, again, is so that you can share it among multiple builds. Let's say, for example, you have that you're using the same architecture, whatever it happens to be. Let's say you're using an ARM architecture, and you're you, but you have to build multiple OSs, so you don't want to build them in the same build directory. Although you could, in which case you might have multiple build directories, but you still want to share those downloads and you want to share that shared state cache, so you don't just keep rebuilding it from scratch every time. Put them up here at this layer here, such that you can share them across multiple builds. We say build directory here, there might be 5, 10, 15 build directories, perfectly acceptable, this level. We're going to go ahead and cover how to use the layers and how to change them, even though there's stuff that's in here in this Pocky. You say, oh, well, I want to, I'm not really going to use Pocky, but I want to be able to modify it. Yeah, it's not a good idea to modify Pocky. And the reason why is, especially if you're using this Git method, what happens to all of your changes to MetaPocky when you update and do a pull, hmm, your changes will get reverted. Let's make sure that we don't have that happen by not using and modifying something in MetaPocky, but maybe we create our own MetaFoo OS layer, for example, and we'll talk about that here in just a bit. Okay, all right. Inside of Pocky here, you'll notice that there's a couple of layers here. We're showing our beginnings of our layers. The first layer that we're showing here is what we call meta, you'll see it right here. It's open embedded core. These are recipes and configuration pieces that you can use and indeed that almost every distribution is going to use, right? We're gonna have a license directory here because licenses matter, especially one of the things that, one of the strengths that the Octo projects brings is the ability to track licenses so that you know what's actually in your images. And by actually knowing what's in your images, you can know what you have to do in order to satisfy the license requirements for whatever software that you're using inside of it, such that you keep yourself out of trouble. We can create tarballs, for example. There's a BB class that allows us to create tarballs of 
source code that you've downloaded and used to, to build things that have certain kinds of licenses like copy left licenses, for example, might require you to make that source code available. Again, tra keeping track of the licenses helps us a lot to be able to figure out exactly what it is that we need to do. We have a readme file. We have a readme for the different hardware that's supported by Pocky. Pocky supports five pieces of hardware along with QEMU. Okay, so all of our emulation, all of our QEMU x86 and ARM and RISC-V and all those things are supported along with five different hardware architectures. And we'll, we'll talk about those here in just a bit. We have a copy of BitBake, right? So one of the things that happens when you check out, when you go ahead and check out a version, download a version, however you want to do it, is that you're going to get a BitBake that's been tested against this version of Meta, this version of Meta Pocky, and this BSP here. So these have all been worked together such that we know that they're going to work together and that they've got as few bugs as possible within that. Okay. So you're going to get a copy of this. This is our build tool here. We do have a copy of documentation. The documentation comes in RST formats. Some of them are um, some of them also are in HTML format. There's a tool as part of our scripts and tools that allows us to um, turn that documentation into HTML or into PDF or something like that, depending upon what we need. One of the strengths that the Yocto project has is documentation, almost to the point where some people have said there's too much documentation. I don't agree. There's never too much documentation in any project. That's one of the things that the Yocto project is very, very strong on and has done an excellent job on. So then we have our first layer here. Like I said, OE core here. Here's our meta layer here. You'll, we, you'll notice the name meta here. It's going to be used for all the layers. It's going to be meta something or just simply meta. So OE core is simply called meta. As a matter of fact, that's what its layer name is. And that's also what its um, directory name is. We then have meta pocky here. Meta pocky is our distribution layer here, right? That rides on top of the base layer here, this OE core layer here. And it's going to implement policy changes and modifications to recipes through using the concept of BB appends such that you are able to um, modify what you want to build for, want to build in this OE core layer here. On top of that, you'll notice that there's a BSP layer. In this particular case, MetaYocto BSP is going to have changes and policy machine configuration pieces, if you will, for each one of the machines that are supported by the Octo project. Now, if you if you want to find the QEMU recipes, they're all here in Meta. They're not up here, right? If you want to find the actual Yocto kernel recipes, they don't exist up here in the BSP. There are modifications for them. There are configurations for them. But there are, but the actual recipes exist in this meta here. So generally, there's between one and three kernel recipes per version, per release, I should say, of of um, the Octo project. In the case of ones that are long-term stable versions, you know, there's generally one. So, for example, the previous Dunfell used 5.4. The current Kirkstone uses 5.15 but there's only one kernel in that particular case. The other ones, the other versions of releases every other six months are generally speaking between two and three, depending on how it's set up. Those recipes will exist here. They'll have modifications in Metapocky through configuration or, or appends and likely also through configuration changes in the BSP, depending on what machine you actually choose to build for, okay? We have an OE init build environment script. Remember up here, we said that this build here, we're going to call that build directory here. We're going to call this right here, and we're going to use this to set up all the environment variables, the initial environment variables, and then you're going to give it an actual build, build directory name. So you're going to say yeah, build directory will be x86, or maybe it's QMU arm, or whatever it happens to be, or maybe it's foo, you know, your foo machine whatever it happens to be. 
as far as that goes. And you, like I said, you can have multiples of these builds if you want to do that. And then finally, we have some scripts and utilities, things that allow us to do um, like WIC for being able to create images and that run QEMU script that we talked about a little bit earlier that enables us to, to start uh, to uh, try and start a QEMU session as far as that goes. There's a whole bunch of stuff in addition to that. There's some additional recipes. There's some license files in here. There's all kinds of stuff as far as that goes. Actually, the license files are here. I'm wrong. They're in, uh, they're in meta. Okay. So let's start talking about once we've gone ahead and untarred it here, we've gone ahead and created our build directory by invoking this OENIT build environment script. Now we're at the point where we need to take a look at things and figure out now, hmm, what else do I need to be able to do? Well, the first thing we might want to do is, is do some local configuration. And then we also might want to figure out where we're going to throw all those uh, temporary build artifacts. One of the reasons why BitBake is considered to be very heavyweight and large is because there are a lot of temporary build artifacts. In order to be able to um, to build an entire operating system from scratch, there's going to be a lot of stuff floating around. Now, I'm not sure whether we're going to have time to deal with this or not, but there are some. Uh, there is a um, BB class that you can inherit, which will allow you to clean up some of those intermediate temporary build artifacts uh, at at a penalty of you know around 20% time because you're having to delete things as you go along. It will save you space if you're if you're space limited, so be aware of that. So if we go ahead and CD into our Yocto directory here, yep, we're up here at at this level right here. We're going to go ahead and source this OENIT build environment script here. We're going to be looking at the Pocky directory here, and we're going to tell it what the name of the build is. So it may be x86, it may be foo machine, it may be baz, whatever you want to call it, it really doesn't matter. But you're going to want to go ahead and do that. The first time, it's going to set up all the environment variables. The second, third, and fourth times and beyond, it's going to basically make it so that you go back in and it's going to say, oh, yeah, you just got to go ahead and, and, uh, and use the existing uh, environment variables and set them up correctly. Set, sets up all the appropriate paths for using the native tools instead of using the, the, uh, the tools on the machine. Make sure that any local machine tools are in the right place, all of that. So you're going to replace build with whatever directory name you want. You're going to need to rerun this script any new terminal that you go. And the reason why you want to do that is because otherwise, when your build doesn't find the compiler, the right compiler, and starts building for x86 instead of start, instead of building for QEMU ARM, yeah, that's going to be a problem. Again, we want to make sure that it sets up those environment variables correctly. So go ahead and rerun this script, any resource the script, anytime you start with a new terminal. Okay, as far as that goes. Once you get into your build directory, you'll notice that there's a lock file. BitBake uses lock files the same as you'll find with make and other things as well. There'd be a cache here. This is just for this is what BitBake uses to keep track of what it's going to build. Then there'll be a conf directory. So one of, and we'll talk about this, about what's required in conf directories based upon different layers here in just a bit. So we have a bblayers.conf. That tells us what layers we're going to include in our build. We're going to have a local.conf, and that tells us what this particular machine is going to, what configuration this particular machine is going to use. You're going to, you might set things like where your downloads directory are, where your shared state cache is, how many, um, parallel threads you're going to run, things like that, as far as that goes. Additionally, you might set some other things here in, in local.comp as well. The other thing you're going to do in local.comp is you're going to define what machine you're going to be building for. You're going to be building for QMUX86, or you're going to be building for your Foo machine, or you're going to be building for a Beagle Bone Black. All of that, which machine you're actually going to build for will, generally speaking, be in this local.comp. Optionally, you might have a site.conf, depending on your particular situation. Let's say you're working in a group and you want to set some policies or you want to build certain things. You might have a site.conf that says, hey, all of our build direct, all of our um, 
shard state cache is over here on this NFS server, or the downloads directory is um, for everybody is going to be over on this NFS server, or maybe it's somewhere else. Maybe you've got a mirror, for example, that you want to use to grab your local files here. They're all going to be over on this particular Git server or wherever they're going to be. All of those things would be in your site.com, for example. And again, that would be shared among everyone who's using it. There'll be a temp directory. Remember I said that there's two temp directories. The first one is this temp here. This is where we're going to find our builds. This is we're going to find all of our builds by, by machine, by architecture, by package, things like that. So expect to see all of that in there. Let's say you want to go ahead and you say, you know, I just got to start over because everything I'm doing looks perfectly fine. I can't make it so that other people who are telling me this doesn't build I'm going to go ahead and just trim that tree right there at temp. Once you do that, you have to rebuild everything. Another good reason to put your shared state cache outside, for example, right? So that you don't end up wiping out your shared state cache. Don't want to do that. All right. So let's talk about generally how we're going to build a Linux image here. We're going to create that project by using whatever the project is by sourcing this OENIT build environment script. We're going to go ahead and configure the build by editing local.conf. Generally speaking, we're at least going to tell it what machine we're going to build from. And we're probably going to tell it where to find the, the downloads and the shared state cache. That's kind of a minimum amount that you'd have to do with regard to that. Then you can go ahead and build a selected image. These core images are all located in that meta directory here. So if you want to look for them, you can find them in meta here. So you can find things that are core dash image. Right. So let's take a look at how we're actually going to do this here. So let's go ahead and edit our local.conf here. We have a machine here, which is we've decided is going to be QEMUR. Now, the default is depending on what version you've checked out is QEMUX86 or QEMUX8664. So there is a default machine in there, typically speaking, especially if you get it directly from the Octo project. You're going to go ahead and tell it where your directory are. Topter is one of those variables. Topter is that as soon as you uh, go ahead and source this OENIP project build environment script here for your project, you're going to get dropped into Topter. Important thing to note about Topter is Topter is where you will always run BitBake from. You always want to run BitBake from that Topter. Otherwise, it won't pick up all the dependencies. Be sure to always run it from there. If you run it from somewhere else, you can expect that it's going to miss dependencies and it may just flat not work. So running it from the directory you've been editing in, not a good idea. Running it from Topter, always a good idea because then it'll pick everything up as far as that goes. Okay. So that's what Topter is. You'll notice that we're going up above one layer here, up above Topter and another one Again, our shared state cache up above it. So it's going to live right here. So it's going to live right here, just like we showed a little bit earlier. Okay. Build. Here's our downloads. Here's our shared state cache. You can use it across multiple builds easily as far as that goes. All right. Once you've set up those three variables there, it's pretty much ready to go. Now you could have to do some additional things to make it so that it works correctly in parallelism and everything else, but just that's the basics right here. Right. You can go ahead and set those variables here. Right. You can use it because, again, you're inside of the environment as far as at that point. You all the paths are going to work correctly because it's you've once you've sourced that BitBake has got all of its environment as far as it goes been set. All right. We're going to choose one of those available images. We're going to go ahead and use our core image minimal. It's going to find it in meta. But you're not going to have to worry about that because BitBake's going to look around and figure out where everything is. Okay. On a fast computer, it may take better part of an hour. On a slow computer, maybe multiple. Now, in today's images, I would say this would probably take somewhere around 35 to 40 minutes to do the first time. And the reason why it's 35 to 40 minutes in a four core, you know, eight gigabyte type, you know, i5 type system here. Uh, you do very well with it as far as that goes. The first thing to note is, is that you 
might be say, oh my goodness, this build is taking a long time. Well, the first thing that happens is it has to build the tool chain and it has to build all the native applications all the native things that you're gonna use for being able to actually build your environment here. So you'll notice that there's, in a modern version such as Kirkstone, there'll be two sets of numbers with a slash in between them. The first set is gonna be all of that tool chain tasks, all of the all of the building of the native things will be on that left-hand side. Right-hand side of that is going to be a list, it's gonna be a number that keeps track of the actual target builds tasks that are being done. So obviously the target build may have the same source, use the same source code as the natives. So therefore that task will be go ahead and be ticked off on the right hand side, even though it was done by something that was done to build the native or to build the tool chain, for example, as far as that goes. So first time through, going to build a tool chain, going to build the natives. Second and, second, and, and additional times, you're only going to be building the actual target itself. So a little bit difference in time, and you'll notice that. And indeed, in earlier versions, you'd see it say, I got 5,000 tasks to do. It would go 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, and then it would say 13,500 tasks, and you go, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought we were done. We were only supposed to do these 5,000 tasks. No, you built the tool chain. You built the natives. Now you can move on to actually building the target itself. Okay, as far as that goes. Again, if you've got shared state cache and you've already built it one time, it may only take five minutes. Perfectly normal for this. If you start over with a new library and or an updated version of the library, it might rebuild everything. Like if you're building a new version of glibc, yeah, it's going to start over again because everything's got to be built against that new version, for example. Okay, once you've done the build, this core image minimal here, then the next thing we're going to do is use this run QEMU script. Again, it tries to remember based upon the architecture that you're using to find the last version of a root file system and indeed a kernel or, or um, and, in, and other pieces that are necessary. Now, it turns out QEMU ARM does not require you to build a kernel for it because it has one already. And also it has configuration bits as well because QEMU is like any other machine. That is to say, it's going to also have its own version of the DTS files here, the DTBs. So that'll all be handled for you. However, it's going to look for this, this um, core image minimal. So you're building an actual image. That's a root file system image in this particular case. That root file system image, if it's successful, should be able to be booted by QEMU and actually run. Okay. So you can go ahead and replace QEMU ARM with your value of machine. Now, you'll notice I'm saying this has to be a QEMU image. You have to be building for that architecture. Could be QEMU x86, could be QEMU um, RISC-564, really doesn't matter. It's still QEMU. It's going to look for the last image that was created with that particular architecture, depending on which architecture you tell it here. Once QEMU uh, it comes up, you can go ahead and log into it just like you would any other image. You can quit and you do a control A X, control A followed by an X to quit the QEMU window. You can go ahead and you know you can kill it from another terminal if you use the no graphic version. If you've got X windows, it will run it QEMU because it's emulating the entire architecture itself between ARM in this particular case and x86 being the native machine is going to be a lot slower than you'd like to see it. It's not going to be a speed demon, especially if you're going to run X windows. It's going to be painfully slow. However, you can emulate things and it does work. You just have to be patient with it as far as that goes. All right. You can go ahead and kill it from another terminal if things go awry. Most of the time, you can go ahead and close it yourself. Control A followed by an X, for example. That's a typical way you do it with it. All right. Are there any questions about the general building of an image? And I'm going to wait here for a few seconds for BN to poke. Are you still with me, BN? If so, give me, go ahead, go ahead and give me a, uh, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
All right. Have I missed anything? That sounds good so far. Okay. Good deal. All right. So let's talk about layers here. Layers, layers. Okay. And by the way, B and tell me when it's time for the quick break here, because I'll I'm not seeing a clock here. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about the concept of layers and show how important they are. And in fact, they are very, very important. When I first started to work with this, I worked with what we would now refer to as OE Classic back in 2004. Everything was all in one directory. The configurations were there. The source code was there. <laughs> well, it wasn't really there. It was. It could be downloaded in there, though. Um, the uh, BB files were there. There was no concept of BB appends at the time. Um, and most importantly, all of the things related to the BSP were also in that same layer, which meant changing between architectures was a royal pain because you had to go and pick out all of the configuration files, all of that source, all of those patches, and pull them all out of there and make sure that you didn't miss any. Because if you missed any patches and you switched architectures, you could end up trying to apply a, 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 a big Indian MIPS patch to a little Indian ARM kernel. And I can't tell you how many times I had to go back and pick, you know, pepper out of things that made it awfully hard, you know, pepper specs out of it. So it was not easy. The concept now is that the that the um, Yocto project brought in was, okay, we need to separate those things out, especially we need to separate out those things that are related to the BSP and the hardware and the patches and all of that to make it easier so that you could switch between architectures because people didn't always use the same architecture for machines. And so we had to have some way to separate it out. So we do use this metadata in this series of layers, which allows you to override any value. Now, the override is another concept that was introduced when layers were introduced, and that's the concept of an append a BB append, a BB class append, things like that. So very, very nice. So you can go ahead and use the BB append to add or edit the originally provided files, but leave them alone. You don't want to mess with, for example, the kernel recipe. You just want to add some configuration changes. Well, you can do that in another layer. Let's say, for example, you want to, your particular version um, wants to build a library with X support in it. Normally, it wouldn't be built with X support in, in by open embedded core, but you need that X support. So you're going to go ahead and rather than having to copy that recipe into your layer, go ahead and make an and make that change where you add the option to build it to build X. You go ahead and instead use a BB append that just adds that functionality to the existing recipe, modifies it, if you will. and allows that to, the original recipe to be unmolested. You just let it let it build add your particular option, build it the way you want to. Good to go, right? A layer is a logical collection of metadata. It includes configuration data. It includes potentially classes. Let's say you have a class that you build that you might want to apply to a whole bunch of other things, executable metadata, often Python, mostly Python, as far as that goes. You also um, have your own recipes, perhaps, in your layer. And you also have some appends that might apply to other layers, for example. Those are the common things you might find in a layer, as far as that goes, right? Layers used to represent OE core. We talked about that. That's that meta layer, a board support layer. Generally speaking, it will have a meta, whatever that is, and then use the term BSP as well, so you know it's a BSP. It might be your application stack, where your application developers take care of it. And it might be your new additional pieces, for example, if you're building libraries or whatever it is you need to be able to support. Layers have the concept of priority, and that makes it a lot easier. Some layers may be policy layers, distribution layers, for example, or policy layers. I'm going to build with X. I'm not going to build with X. I'm going to use, um, let's say, for example, I want to make sure that I always in every time I want to build this, I want to use open SSH server instead of drop bear. That's a policy change that you'll you'll make and say all of my images include open open SSH server. We're not going to build, we're not going to use drop bear as our SSH server. We just don't use it in our particular policy. 
other things as well might be in that policy, if you will. Okay. And we can then override that policy in our own layers. Let's say, for example, we build one version without X because we don't have a display on that particular model, but another model has a, has a, has a uh, display on it. And so therefore we are going to build with X in that particular one. Again, you can override that policy of not building with X by your layer, for example, saying it's going to be use it. And then there's configuration layers that you can use uh, depending on the priority, you can override other layers, for example. And we'll see some of that where we can talk about, um, we want to, yeah, yes, um, Open Embedded Core has version 150 of that particular package, but our for whatever reason, we can't use 150 and we have to use 149, 1.4.9, because that's the version that we're able to support. 1.5.0 does not work in our environment. We'll go ahead and actually maybe build our own package recipe for that, right? That's that's and then tell, um, and then our layer will tell Open Embedded Core that yes, while well, you have 150 in the build, we we want 149 in our build because we can't use 150 for some reason. Okay, whatever that reason happens to be, that's a policy change. We'd have to be able to override the normally we're going to build 150, which is the later version. We have to tell it, nope, we want to build 149. That's a policy change that we might make in our layer. We want to use this version. We might set a preferred version, if you will, in our layer, as far as that goes. All right. So uh, we talked a little bit about the layer cake before. We talked about these three layers here. Generally speaking, uh, this meta layer is going to be used in pretty much every recipe. It contains things like libraries. It contains core utilities. It contains uh, file utilities. It contains networking things. All of those things you're going to find in meta. There's a whole bunch of good stuff in there. And meta, like anything else, has seen itself. Go, things go in and out of the layer in different, ver yeah, it, it, in different recipes have come in and out over time but it's got a pretty good set of things that you can expect to find in there. It has enough It has enough there to show the demonstration of building for X windows or Wayland Weston. You can build, um, you can build kernels with it. You can build, um, you can build all the native tools that you need with it. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. Could you build without any of these other layers and just meta? Absolutely. Uh, it's better if you have other layers. Let's put it to you that way. Meta Pocky here, this is our reference distribution. We need to talk about that as just being the reference distribution. So we'll often say that this is where our distribution policy lives with regard to that. Meta Pocky is the first thing I tell people when they get a version is to change the name of this. Let's say your, your OS is Foo OS. So you're going to say Meta Foo OS. So that's your OS distribution layer here. That's your OS policy layer, if you will, your distribution policy layer here. And you're going to make whatever changes you need to make to that in order to make it so that it applies to your particular um, to your particular distribution, whatever it is. Remember that Yocto Project says we're not a distribution, but we make one for you. We make it so we have tooling so that you can make your own distribution. And indeed, that's why I say change that from Metapocky to whatever you're going to call yours immediately. You're going to have then a BSP layer often. That BSP layer is going to be something that you might change out. So for example, you might build, you might get something from MetaFreeScale, for example, and you'll use their, theirs. But let's say, for example, you're going to go from that, but I have something that I'm going to do that's also x86. So I'm going to use maybe Meta Intel, for example. So that layer might get swapped out. That BSP layer might get swapped out, right? And that's going to be specific to whatever hardware you're using for that particular thing. Now, does that mean that you can swap them in and out at will? Yes, you pretty much can. This layer cake is going to be defined in bblayers.com. It's going to be defined at topter, conf, it's the sub subdirectory, and then there's going to be a bblayers.com in there. What the order is of that is, has something to do with priority. Additionally, there's layer priority within that, so we can talk about that in just a bit. So these three are the typical ones you're going to be using, right? You're going to define a, you're going to use meta. You're going to use some distribution. 
doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be Metapaki. Probably won't be Metapaki, hopefully. And then a BSP layer that applies to whatever you're going to be building for, whatever your target is. Again, may come from a vendor, may come from one that you built yourself, may come from the Octo project if you're using the hardware that, that's theirs. That's one of the ones that they're already using. On top of that, we have a UI GUI layer. This is an optional layer. Does not is not required to build normal builds. If you don't have a GUI or you don't have a UI, um, you're not running. Uh, you're not running something that um, has either Wayland Weston or or QT five or GTK or any of that stuff. You don't have to have this layer. It'd be nice if you had it if you need it. As far as that goes, on top of that, we may have this OSV layer. You may end up have bought Wind River Linux, you may have something that looks like Petal Linux, for example, from Xilinx, depending upon what hardware you're using and whether you purchased a commercial layer here, depends on what you're going to get here. And then on top of this, you'll probably put developer layers here. Now, everything up to here, all the way up to here, is what I call systems programming, right? These are all the underlying things that you need to have in order to make it so that the developers, the application developers, can actually have all the tooling and all of the libraries they, they need. Above this, you might have a developer layer or layers, depending upon how you want to divide that out. If you've got a single developer who's doing the app, and it may be you, even though you're also doing these other layers, then, you know, Having it separated out means that you can actually make it so that you can debug things. Hmm, I've got a problem here that the build doesn't work. Something in meta is not working. So I'm going to just throw away these top three layers and stop using them to comment them out. And therefore, I can just build these three layers. OK, well, it builds all those three layers. Let's add the GUI back in. Yeah, it works fine. Let's add the commercial layer back in or the develop. Oh, yeah, it broke now. OK, now we can start debugging it. Similar to anything else for debugging, you can separate things out to make them easier. Doing layers makes your life easier. It also means that when it's time to switch from one piece of hardware to a different piece of hardware, you slide this BSP layer out, you put a new BSP layer in, and you rebuild it. Right? You go from big Indian MIPS to little Indian ARM, easy peasy. Change out this layer, tell it, tell local.com that you're building for a new machine, and Viola. Now it's going to, when they, you get to that new architecture, what's it going to do? It's going to rebuild the tool chain again. It's going to see that the natives have already been built, so it's not going to have to build those. And then it's going to start building for that new architecture for you. This is the beauty of this. Swap out the BSP layer, change a line of, of configuration, build and profit. Any questions on any of this? Okay. All right. So let's talk about how layers are added to your build, right? We put them into this BB layers variable. This BB layers variable is going to be at the top dir conf layer. So this, this Yocto, whatever the name of your build is, conf directory. So it's top dir conf. And we have BB layers.conf. Inside there, there's a variable called BB layers. We go ahead and use this continuation symbol over here to make it more readable, but it certainly is just a list, right? It's just a, a path list here. We're going to tell it we're going to use the Pocky meta version. That's our open embedded core. We're going to then on top of that layer meta Pocky. That's our distribution layer again. And then finally, we're going to use our BSP layer on top of that. Now, you'll notice that there's no references to priorities. Those priorities are contained within the layer conf for each of those layers. So conf layer.conf is where you're going to find that. And we'll talk about that, uh, that file here in just a minute. So the order of these does matter. This is the first one it's going to parse. Then the second one it's going to parse is this one. And the third one it's going to parse is your BSP layer. So if you want to, and this is especially important down at your layers where you're talking about your different layers, you've got to, generally speaking, you want to make sure that your library layer gets put in before your applications layer gets put in so that it reads that first and says, ah, oh, we don't have a dependencies. Oh, yeah, they're met. No problem. As far as that goes. 
All right, BSPs are layers, just like anything else. They're enabled support for specific hardware platforms. If you take a look at the BSP layer for Metayocto, you'll find that it contains hardware configurations and it contains a couple of things related to um, a specific piece of hardware, um, especially uh, Intel form factor stuff. Form factor has to do with this the X window screens, bit depths, you know, geometry, things like that, as far as that goes. All right. It also defines um, machine specific recipes and customizations generally for your bootloader, right? For your kernel config. Generally speaking, that'll have options that are specific to your particular thing. For example, there's no reason to turn on SMP on a single core machine such as a, such as a Big Bone Black. On the other hand, if you're going to use the Big Indian MIPS, um, it's a quad core MIPS processor, so they turn on SMP support, for example. Those kind of things are going to be in that configuration, the kernel configurations. We're also going to have to build specifically for a particular piece of hardware. So for example, if you're building a bootloader, you want to make sure that if you're building one for a big Indian MIPS or a little Indian ARM or a or or, or something like that, you want to make sure that you get the right version of the bootloader built, right? With the for the right architecture. Any additional graphics things, you'll notice that there's some graphics stuff here. Again, that form factor that you'll find is related to things like it's a 640 by 480 screen with 8 BPP or 16 BPP, whatever it happens to be, as far as that goes. There are some additional recipes to support some hardware features. For example, some vendors will provide things for their super secret, you know, offload TCP offload engine. So, for example, in the case of the, some of the big of the of the MIPS processors that are used for routers, for example, very common, they have a TCP offload engine and they'll have the additional recipe pieces to build the correct modules for loading that particular TCP offload engine piece, for example. Any questions on any of this? Are there any questions at all, Bian, or are you just handling them all? Uh, the, the questions were were basically around um, around some of the things you were talking about. So I've, we, there's been a couple of us that have just been answering the questions okay. uh, in the chat. So yeah, no, the um, they they were they were uh, uh, tangential to some of the things you were you're talking about, and uh, so we, we just we just answered them. Um, uh, it's about twenty minutes until the the break. Just just to give you an idea. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Very good. Uh, give me the five minute warning then. Okay. All right. When doing development with Yocto, do not edit files within the Pocky source tree. Remember, I said to you that one of the worst things you can do is modify Meta Pocky and then decide, oh, I should update it because there's a new thing that just came along. And uh oh. Yeah. When you do that update, you know, to go to a point, new point release and all of your stuff disappears, mm, not good as far as that goes. Again, meta, OE core. We're going to tell you this over and over when using layers here. Append, don't copy it. Don't move that, don't essentially move that recipe into your layer. Copy the, the recipe, move it into your layer, modify it, and now you own it for the rest of your life and you've got to maintain it even if they updated underneath you to make your life easier. No, just do the appends. Oftentimes the thing that you want to have done or the patch that you need to apply or whatever it is to the underlying version has been fixed in the next layer. The bug that you're worrying about that you've actually patched around by creating your own version of it by, by uh, that you've created your own version to solve the problem of has been completely fixed for you. And so you don't have to worry about it. Mm. So. Any of these layers here, don't do that. Now, let's talk about the BSP. Probably the most common one is that you wanna go ahead and um, in your BSP that you get from your vendor, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and modify that configuration data. You might wanna modify patches um, and things like that. Mm, how do you handle that? Where does that go? Um, well, there's also, a question, there's also a question here about Metapocky. 
uh, um, Alexander says, uh, you, you said to rename Metapocky, but at the same time, we should not change anything there. Can you clarify that? Yeah. So when I say Metapocky, OK, let's go back here to where is where is it? Come on. There. OK, so <clears throat> remember, I said don't modify Metapocky. So so what you're going to do is you're going to make let's say instead you make a copy of Metapocky is a better way to say it. <clears throat> And then you replace this metapocky layer right here with your version of whatever you call it, metafoo. So you're going to actually slide your version here. And therefore, at that point, let's say you just leave metapocky alone. You're going to go ahead and copy the data that's in there because you want to use all that configuration as a starting place. And then go ahead and change it to metafoo OS, for example. Instead of pointing to home yocto pocky you're going to point it to whatever your directory is and then you'll put it in your cms when you're done and it becomes your distribution layer at that point you're not using pocky you may copy some things over later on when you update pocky you may say yeah that's a good idea it fixes a problem but then it becomes yours again the reason why you want to do that is so that when the update happens it doesn't wipe out what you've done did that answer the question Yes, uh, it says, uh, thanks, that helps. All right. <laughs> Is there a better way to say that, Bian? Not at all. No, that, that worked well. Okay, good deal. All right. All right. So once you go ahead and not edit those files, and that includes editing anything in meta, instead, append, 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 append it in your layer, right? Maybe you make append it in your distribution layer if it's going to apply to all of the distribution. Maybe you do that in the hardware layer if it's going to apply only to a particular piece of hardware. Maybe you're going to do it based on what application you're going to be running. Hmm. This application requires this support, therefore we've got to turn on this at this other in this other layer. Again, append, 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 or alternatively modify in a configuration file if you need to. Okay, Your new custom layer then, whatever that happens to be, creates it. Remember, it's going to be one of these. Typically, it's going to be one of these developer layers here. Maybe it's going to be your own GUI layer here, whatever you choose to do here. Again, most of the time, you're not going to touch these three. You're, I'm sorry. You're going to touch this one because it's going to become your own. You're going to leave this one alone. You're going to get this BSP often from your vendor, whether it be from, you know, especially if you're starting with the reference platform and then building your board, you know, using that, then you'll go ahead and do an append that may add functionality or may decide that my version of this is only has one serial port or my version uses two serial ports here, or I re respun the, um, the BSP so that the pin mux is different, then you're going to go ahead and apply that to your DTS files, for example, you'll create yourself for example, those kinds of things. So again, with this flexibility does come cause complexity, right? Hmm, could I put that, could I put that um, developer layer, tell the BSP that I've got a new, that I'm using it in a different way. And so therefore we're gonna respin it. No, typically not. You're not gonna tell the BSP layer that the hardware configuration changed. You're gonna go ahead and add a board configuration for your particular board in this and it's going to apply to that bsp layer could you put it in another layer yes you can and i've seen that done so you use the existing one that comes from whoever and then you modify it for all of the things that use that particular board i've seen that done you have a bsp layer i've seen a little bsp layer above this which is your configuration changes that apply specifically to the bsp that's what i've seen done if you want to do it that way. Sometimes instead you'll do it a different way. And that is you copy the BSP, change the name of it to your own version, and then make all the changes in it. I kind of like the other way where the BSP layer has, has a modification layer directly above it. Makes it a little bit easier. Again, if they fix a problem, you can eliminate having to have that append, for example, if you need that. All right. So you build your new custom layer for your modularity and maintainability. Again, this belongs to you. Don't forget that you're going to have to add it to BB layers, right? In order for the build to pick it up. 
we're going to go ahead and create a way to port from one version of Yocto to another. So let's say, for example, these three are going to change out from under this one and the BSP layer change out from underneath you. You can still ver change the version. Now, remember that we're up here. We saw that we were going to have um, right here. We're going to have a version of BitBake that's going to come with a new version of Pocky. We're going to have a new version of Meta, and we're going to have a new version of the BSP and Meta Pocky too. We're going to definitely probably use the new version of Meta, right? We're definitely going to use the new version of BitBake, and so we can slide those out from underneath. And again, the layers, the layers here are going to be defined right here as to what what we're actually going to use. So we may point to a new version of Pocky, right? We're going to and we're going to point to a new version of, of Meta here and a new version of maybe a BSP, for example. But that we can easily do so that the upgrade's fairly painless. Again, this version right here, especially if you're not going to, if you're not using Meta Pocky, you're using Meta Foo OS, for example, will be painless because Meta has changed, the BSP layer may or may not have changed, and your distribution layer hasn't changed. You can start then trying to rebuild it. Now, it may break things along the way because they went to a later version of a library, for example, that may break things at different layers. We'll see that and how to deal with that in just a bit here. All right, so porting from one version to another, a lot easier here. Again, we'll swap out the appropriate layers and we'll say and look and test the build and see if it's gonna work or not. We'll see that. So how do we create a layer here, right? Right now, up until this point, we've been using existing layers and we've just been swapping them in and out. So you'll notice the convention is, is that they can be created manually. Not pretty. Can be done. It's a lot of work. They all start with the word meta dash followed by a con, you know, by convention. Your layers will all have, should all have, not will have, should by by best practice start with the word meta. So if you have meta foo OS, perfectly fine. If you have a meta foo hardware layer, perfectly fine but all of them are going to start with the word meta dash as far as that goes. You can, however, use the BitBake layers tool and create an actual layer. In this case, we're going to use meta YPDD for our Yocto project developer day here. And this will create the meta YPDD in, a, in the current directory. It's going to create a layer for you there. It's going to create a subdirectory. It's going to, it's going to also include uh, certain additional things like some example recipes and subdirectories. It's also going to create a layer.conf for you inside of that directory, a conf layer.conf, which is required as far as that goes, right? We're going to go ahead and source it. Here's our build directory, whatever it's called. We're going to create a new layer called YPDD, right? And then by default, it's going to go, it may ask you questions, you know, what's the layer priority? What's the, do you want to have the example recipe created? I generally say yes, because it's a great starting place. And then it, we can change the name. For example, we can change it to whatever you really want to call it as your first recipe. And then go ahead and create a BB append file. And do you want to create BB append or not? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe your layer is all it's going to contain is a single BB append. This makes it easy. Yeah. Priority of six. Create the example recipe. No, create the create the BB append. Yep, we're going to create the BB append. But what's the name of it going to be? At that point, it's going to have done several things here. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to create the directory structure that's necessary. The second thing it's going to do is it's going to create the local conf local .conf file, which is required in order for you to have a new layer. That's very very important because inside of that layer .conf is going to be a file spec pattern that's going to be used by BitBake to find all the BB, BB files and BB append files. And that file spec is going to be really important, that search spec, if you will, in order for it to gather up all those recipes and parse them at the beginning. Don't forget, you're also going to have to add it to your BB layers, right? We're going to have to go back here to BB layers here and add it to the bottom here. Generally speaking, it'll go on the bottom. Your, your layer is going to go on the bottom. Unless you're replacing one of these layers here, it's going to go right there, right? So that it can be actually used. 
BitBake, when it first starts, is going to start looking in these directories and start looking for those conflayer.conf files in order to be able to figure out how to find further find the BB and BB append files. So very, very important. Every layer must have a conflayer.conf. Okay. All right. And then add it to that. So let's take a look at what the tree looks like here. So a typical one when you use the BitBake layers tool is it'll create an, a license file. They just chose the MIT file. It's very common for metadata to use MIT. You can choose whatever license that you you want to choose. It's not required to be there. Oh, I'm sorry. The license file should be there and is, I believe, is required in every one of them. Those are going to be a readme file. It's just a, it's just a point for it. It's just a starting point. Additionally, we're going to have this comp layer.conf required by for every single layer. And in this case, if you told it to go ahead and build a recipe, here you'll have ex recipes example, recipe in the example subdirectory underneath that, and then example 0 0.1. So that's a, a very common way of starting this. So there's a patch. Here's a hello world.c. And I don't, I'm not sure that it creates those two things. I think it creates this here. Um, and then Here's a BB file, and I do know that it creates the BB file. It may or may not create that. So let's take a look at what's inside of layer.conf. And this is not all of what's in layer.conf. This is the minimum, pretty much the minimum required to make this work. So the first thing you'll notice here is that it has this BB path, and it's an immediate expansion here. And it's going to say this is the layer directory. It's going to point to the actual file. Um, Pretty sure it's it's relative uh, for the layer dir. Actually, it's not. Sorry, it's not relative. It's absolute um, for the layer dir. The second thing you'll notice here is it's going to create a BB files and it's going to append it. Right, it's going to add to it. It's going to create this layer dir look pointing to this, and it's going to look in these subdirectories here, and it's going to look for BB files and it's going to look for BB appends files. If you don't use this kind of a structure where you use recipes example and then example, and then another subdirectory under 0 0.1 like this, you'll have to change the, the spec for this, the number of stars and the number of subdirectories, if you will. This is the convention and I suggest that you use this because it makes it easier so that when you build a BB append that you know to look in, the, in a particular things like you look in recipes core or recipes or recipes um, library or recipes kernel, right? You do your your BB append here, for example, is easier to find exactly where to look for in the corresponding directory as far as that goes. So go ahead and use it. It'll create this file spec here, this search spec, if you will. The YPDD, that's the going to be the name. You'll notice that that comes from our meta YPDD here. So that's going to be its name. And all these other things are optional here. Layer dir, it, it, that file pattern, it, it creates that. And then uh, and this is very important, by the way, for it to find it. And then the priority of the your particular layer. It could be anywhere between one and six, six being the highest. Now, that makes it so that your layer is pretty powerful and so that it could actually, through your configuration, through either through local.conf or through some of the other um, choices you might make, for example, a BB pin that might override something in a lower layer, as far as that goes. If things don't work quite right and you've got this that you've got this too high or too low, you can play with it there. Remember I said that it, it, it parses them in this order, in the order of the list, right? Parses them in that order. And it also then also looks at the priority of the layer in order to determine whether or not your layer has a lower priority than the, than that of Metapaki, for example, and it, therefore it doesn't modify it. So if you're sitting around, why doesn't this work? You have to look also at the priorities to see how it's done and whether or not you've got a high enough priority to make that work. Okay, let's see. Um, that's layer.com. Again, conf layer.com required in every layer required in every uh, layer that you have. Adding your layer, you'll notice how you do it there. You put it in the bottom here. Don't forget the continuation symbol, no spaces after the continuation symbol. And then you can you can add it there. That's a typical place it will be added. Now, again, you can move those up and down depending on what you need to do in order to get it so that the build actually works correctly and sets priorities. 
All right, any questions to this point? Five minutes, uh, five minutes until the break. Perfect, thank you. All right, uh, let's look here. So here is the BitBake layers um, uh, tool. You can see there's a whole bunch of things you can do with regard to this. I think the most important things you want to do is you can use it to add and remove layers from bblayers.com. You can create layers here, which make your life a little bit easier. Again, it will create all this nice stuff for you here, right? If you want to do that, I suggest that you do that. It just makes your life easier. Um, you can show a pins. This will actually show a list of files. Let me see if they've got the way they've done this. Okay, so they've done the layer. Um, you can show recipes. And then one thing to notice that this tool shows recipes. You'll notice it's plural, right? That means it's going to show all of them. What if you only want to know about a particular recipe? Well, then you're going to have to use filter tools like grep and stuff like that in order to make that work. Okay. So just like a lot of other things, it, it enables you to find things but then you've got to kind of grep them out and figure out exactly what it is you want to know, for example. All right, you can show some cross depends here. I don't know if we've shown dependency graph or not, um, but we. But that's a cool tool as far as that goes. Um, the minus G tool, if you will, for visualization. Now, what if you want to find a layer, right? Because you, you've got, you, look, I, I'm, I've switched and I'm now using, going to be using a, I don't know, I'm going to be using a 96 boards or ART64 here, okay? Well, this is maintained by Lin uh, by um, Linaro here. We've got an ART64, so there's our 64-bit arm here. There's some 96 board stuff again done by the 96 board. These are BSP layers. You can see the meta OE is a base layer here. Open embedded core is another one here, or just simply meta, if you will. You can find recipes, uh, re layers. You can find them by branch of a particular version of um, this. You can find recipes by looking for those and what layer is, find out what layer it's in. You can find out information about different machines, classes, and distributions, depending on what you want to use here. You can also submit a layer to this um, if you're now the maintainer of a layer, for example. Let's see you maintain a particular layer. Most of the time, what you're going to find in here is you're going to find a lot of BSPs in this layer index to try and figure out, because remember, you're going to want to be able to download this. And then once you do, you can use that as your BSP. Oftentimes, there are BSPs in here. There's a lot of them in there, as far as that goes. All right, you can add the layer here. We talked about this. We're going to add the layer. We're going to point the directory to where it's going to be. In this case, it's going to be what a meta YPDD, and it's going to be in our Yocto build. That will put it in that bblayer.com at the bottom, just like it shows right here by using, right? By adding it, uh, by using that tool here, makes it a lot easier as far as that goes. And now you can bit make your example recipe, which you'll notice was a hello world. <clears throat> you'll notice that you can build the example just like we did before, right? We're gonna build, um, build that example 0.1.bb and prop it. All right, I think what we're going to do is we're going to stop here right now um, and we'll come back after the break.